so my name is Stoyan, and I'm a co-founder of the company of Coherent Labs. And I work there as a software architect and product manager on some of our products. I have more than 10 years of professional C and C++ experience, and until today I continue to code very actively on our products, and have been involved in games for, for a lot of time, since the first time that I played a game probably 20 years ago on a PC. I knew that this was what I wanted to do, and this was a career that I wanted to build for myself. And everything I've done uh, career-wise from that moment on has been geared towards working with games, working on uh, game technology. And what do we do in Coherent Labs? We're a game middleware company, so we don't create games per se. We create technology for game companies. Uh, all our products at the moment are user interface middleware, so we help creating the user interface for games. And aside from uh, selling them the technology, we also try to consult the companies that we work with, to partner with them, and to build an end-to-end -end solution uh, to their user interface needs. So we try to uh, build an architecture for their user interface. We try to help them uh, get the best out of the products. And uh, these are some clients that you might, uh, you might see some companies that you know of. Uh, we have, I believe, around 200 companies that use our products and several hundred games that have been released or are currently in development. And uh, we support all major gaming platforms, uh, from PC to consoles to mobile to virtual reality. And everybody who's done uh, multi-platform development knows that, unfortunately, this is uh, one of the biggest difficulties when creating a technological product. And uh, on the client side, currently we work mostly with middle to bigger studios. And uh, probably the largest, uh, the newest successful game that uh, was released with, with our product was uh, PlayerUnknown's Battleground, I think was the name of the game, which yesterday reported that they have sold 4 million copies and made $100 million. So they're doing pretty awesome. So how did we start this company? Everything happened in 2012, so five years ago. Uh, we founded it, me, George, Dimitar, and Nicola. We were working together on an MMO game in a company called Masthead Studios. And uh, the game was quite interesting. It had an interesting technology, very ambitious. We were 120 people. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't do very well commercially. So at one moment, uh, we found ourselves unemployed. And uh, although the game didn't do very well, I was extremely happy with, with my time there because it was a possibility for me to learn how to create complex technology. And I met amazing people, not only my co-founders, but uh, all the programmers, the designers, the artists there who did a great job. And uh, as we found, found ourselves unemployed, we knew that we wanted to continue to work something in games. There was, of course, the possibility to try and do something else in IT. Uh, there is always demand for, for programmers. But uh, games was what we were in for. And again, there were two possibilities. We could have started creating our own game, but uh, there were some critical resources missing. Uh, we were all tech guys. We had no designer, we had no artist, and a game without an artist and design is not a game, in my opinion. So we also didn't have money to hire such people, and decided to do what we knew we were good at, and that was technology. And uh, the other thing was that while working on that game, we had identified a certain problem in the development, and we believed that we had an idea on how to solve that problem. So why did we start the company? Because we knew we had to work on game technology. Uh, we had identified a concrete problem on the development. And we hoped that we had a good solution for that. We weren't sure. We're pretty sure now. But at that moment, it was not uh, a done deal. So 
my advice for everybody who wants to create a company, don't create a company just because you want to have a startup or you want to work on, on something interesting. Uh, create it only if you have the passion, but also if you have a product that actually uh, will solve the problem of somebody in this world and that somebody is ready to pay you money, real money, to, to solve that problem. And as I said, everything we do, we do is uh, on user interface uh, technology. So now I'll show you three screenshots from games that use our technology just to give you a, a better idea about how user interface, a modern user interface in a big game looks like and the requirements that it has. Uh, this is from a game called uh, Fractured Space from a UK company. It's a free-to-play game. And uh, in the middle, you have uh, the spaceship. It's a, it's a game, obviously, with spaceships. But you also have a list of uh, spaceships that you can buy or you can use in the, in the game, uh, a list of crew. Everything is very dynamic. This is a still shot, but uh, if you look at the game, you'll see that uh, the portraits of the players are animated. Everything has motion graphics, and it moves. So the first thing to note is that the user interface is, uh, in games especially, has evolved a lot and is a complex piece of graphics work. Uh, it's a lot more complex than the user interface that you might find in Microsoft Word or uh, even visual tools like Photoshop and so on, where the user interface is usually uh, very uh, buttons and drop-downs centric. The other game is uh, Drop Zone from Sparky Pants. Here uh, you can see the UI, which is in-game. You have uh, the different abilities of the player, a mini-map, and so on. And uh, the important here, uh, thing to note here is that the UI has to go alongside the game. This means that the performance is extremely important. Uh, when you want your game to run at 60 frames per second, you only have 16 uh, milliseconds uh, and a bit more for each frame. So uh, for the UI, people don't usually allocate more than 10% of that budget. So everything we do, uh, all the rendering, all the logic, everything has to happen in roughly 1 millisecond, 1.5 on consoles. So there are uh, significant technical challenges there. And the third one is from uh, an upcoming game, Low Breakers, uh, from a guy named Cliff Brzezinski, quite famous. And uh, here I want to uh, highlight that the UI in modern games has a lot uh, of interactions with other, other things that are not strictly within the game. And that is social interaction, so integration with uh, achievements, Twitter, Facebook, uh, video playback. Microtransactions are very important. You want your gamers to uh, spend money within your game and not, uh, and not somewhere else, so they shouldn't go out of the game to, to purchase things, uh, because otherwise the chance of them spending money is, is a lot lower. And this comes to testify that UI has evolved a lot and is very complex. And uh, in the game that we were creating at uh, Masthead, we had almost all of these uh, feature requirements for the UI. And we struggled a lot while creating them. There are different approaches to create the UI. You can do it uh, in C++. Uh, it was done in this way probably 20 years ago. Uh, you can do it uh, with some custom system of your engine or in the scripting that your engine uh, uses. But very often, people use a tool that is designed uh, and is uh, useful to artists and UI designers. And in the case of our game, Earthrise, uh, that was a middleware solution that worked around Flash. So you could uh, use Flash to uh, design your UI, but uh, the iterations were extremely slow. You had a team that was creating the UI that was designing it. You had a team that was coding it in ActionScript because uh, that middleware required a lot of code in, in the UI itself. And you had the C++ part where you had to hook all that with, uh, with the engine and the logic of the game. And that created a lot of uh, friction within the team. 
a lot of frustration. It was very slow. It required you uh, to stop the game, to restart the game, to see your changes. And UI development is a very artist and designer centric work. You want your designers to be able to iterate very quickly and to try new things and not having to wait for a build or for the game to restart. Other, otherwise, their productivity is extremely limited. And uh, the other thing was that in 2012, Flash was a technology that was rapidly, rapidly declining. I can say that today it's almost dead. And the, the reasons for that are probably political. There was a lot of uh, friction between large companies uh, especially the web-centric companies like uh, uh, Google, uh, Apple, and Microsoft were not very keen to have an other, another company with a cloud standard drive all the dynamic uh, web. And uh, basically, in one way or the other, they were able to, to stop uh, what Flash was. And uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing because uh, Everything uh, now moved to another technology which is more open and is more accessible to a lot more people. So obviously, uh, you know the technology I'm talking about. It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the idea that we had was that the game UI could be created as a web page. Uh, just to give you an idea how that uh, works, you have uh, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript, which are created by the UI team. And you have our runtime that uh, renders that, that uh, runs all the logic within the game and provides the game with a way to communicate with the UI and with the final uh, rendering of, of said UI. It was a fairly new paradigm. There were some mm, tries before us to, to use those technologies to, to do game UI, but uh, they were very unsuccessful. And the, the reasons for that are mostly technical, and I'll get back uh, to that in a moment. But another great benefit was that this technology opened the world of game development to millions of new developers. Uh, everybody who knew HTML or JavaScript could potentially become a game developer and work on, on game UI. And uh, this was a huge win for companies because you can hire different people, more people, talented people. And if you had people who had been working with, uh, with Flash and now felt their career in jeopardy because they were working on a technology that was fading away and they felt stuck, now they, they could go uh, the next level and try new things and uh, go where the, where, the, where the industry basically was, go, uh, was going. Uh, so the idea on paper sounded great. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a but, and it's extremely tough to implement. The web standards are obviously designed for the web. They are not designed for games. And uh, it's mostly a problem of performance because games are extremely performance-centric. Uh, and uh, the web was not designed in this way. So what we had to do is write our own render, which could have uh, the HTML technology inside and give that web webby workflow, and at the same time achieve the requirements of the platforms we were targeting. Another problem that we envisioned and uh, so was that the industry is reluctant to change. And uh, this is probably true for not only for uh, our industry, but for the IT industry and for people in general. When you have been working on something for a decade and, and is a technology that you know, even if it's not the best thing in the world, uh, you kind of feel uh, stuck uh, to that. You kind of feel uh, some, some love for that. And uh, if you offer those people something that is 10% or 20% or 30% better, you won't succeed. Uh, you have to offer something that is two times, three times, five times better. And again, this is an advice that I give uh, to everybody who is trying to start a business. If you're solving a problem, do it twice as better than the current solutions. Otherwise, the chance that somebody will switch to you is extremely limited. So we had to prove <clears throat> and constantly improve the technology. But fortunately, this is what we like. This is what we were in for. 
and uh, was not a problem for us in uh, in a sense of uh, um, passion. And uh, we try to build our products the same way that I believe a successful game should be built. So by always iterating on that, we uh, very often talk to our customers the same way that games should talk and and see how uh, gamers respond to the content that they create and uh, try to build the products in such a way that uh, they make sense to them, that they help them, that uh, it's most convenient. There are pitfalls there uh, that I'll talk about later. But for those five years, we have uh, released four generations, four uh, big uh, leaps in the technologies that we offer. We currently have two flagship product, products, uh, GT and Hummingbird. Uh, GT is mostly for, uh, for PC and consoles, while Hummingbird is a leaner, meaner runtime for PC, consoles, and uh, mobile. And I'm extremely happy because now we have the fastest and most feature complete game UI platforms you can find on the market. At the core of the, of the products that we create and of the uh, success that we currently have as a company is, of course, the team. And uh, when you are starting a company and building your team, it's extremely important for day one for you uh, to build the culture of that company. And that culture comes from the founders. So from day one, decide what will, what will be the focus of that company and uh, repeat it continuously uh, to your team, uh, to your developers, and uh, to everybody. For us, uh, it's, it's a bit of a longer list, but the two most important things were technical excellence. So we really, really wanted to create a technology that uh, amazed people in some way, and uh, partnership with our customers. So uh, we don't just sell them the software and, and that's it. We try to help them to be successful because we know that if our customers are successful, then we are successful. Uh, especially in middleware, try to look for tough challenges, uh, for tough, usually technological challenges, because you get paid only if you solve a real problem, you solve it well, and uh, the cost for other companies to solve it that well is significant. We work in an industry where there are a lot of smart people. So if you solve something simple, probably everybody will be able to solve it as well. And my last advice on, that, on this slide is pick your battles. Uh, don't try to please everybody. It's the same thing as when, if you create a game, you don't want to make a game, uh, at least if you hope for it to be successful, you don't want to create a game that uh, at the same time pleases casual players, hardcore gamers, FPS shooter fans, and uh, real-time strategy uh, fans. You just want to, to, to decide which your customers will be. And uh, when we started the company, uh, we did that. And our product was great if you had HTML or JavaScript experience, but uh, in that way, you could create the UI very fast and so on. But if you didn't have that experience, it was uh, more or less useless. And it was, it was OK with us. We sold only to teams that we knew had those skills and would be successful by using this product, that knew why, why, why they were buying this product. And this allowed us to iterate on that. And uh, in the years when we grew our team and had the possibility, we approached new new verticals. Uh, we added a visual editor, so now if, even if you don't have HTML and JavaScript experience, you can create the UI by dragging and dropping uh, elements and by drawing them. We added an Adobe Animate exporter. Adobe Animate is a tool that is very popular with Flash developers, so even if you had uh, experience with Flash or with other game middleware uh, solutions that are based on Flash, you can now use our products and at the same time, everything else on top of that uh, that we provide. And this would, if, if we had tried to do everything at the same time, that would, that would have failed. We didn't have the people, we didn't have the resources, and most importantly, we didn't have the knowledge uh, about how people used our products and how they would probably be successful with them. 
I get often asked how uh, do we reach our market as we are a 100% a Bulgarian company. We have our uh, R&D office here. And uh, from day one, we knew that it was important for us to be uh, where our customers are. And uh, currently 70 to 80% of them are United States companies. So we had to be there. Of course, we didn't have the funding to, to open a company in, uh, in the US. Uh, we knew we wanted to work here from, from Sofia. We wanted to build our team here. But uh, we reached them by going to trade shows. Uh, there are a lot of trade shows uh, in our industry. Uh, the biggest one is called GDC. Uh, it has roughly 25 to 26,000 people each year in San Francisco who gather, and it's only uh, a professional conference. There are no gamers there. And uh, it's, a, it's a great way, if you're in this business, to get noticed. Uh, the downside is that it's extremely expensive. But you, if, if you want to, to succeed, I really believe that this is the way to go. It, at the beginning, probably not, because it, it costs a lot of money. But if you want to uh, work with, with bigger companies, with the big players, you have to be there. Uh, just because it's not, they see you there. You know you're alive. And if you can afford it, you're probably a, a serious company. The good thing about Sofia and Bulgaria is that there are a lot of great engineers. So the R&D is, uh, is great here. We were able to find and uh, mm, to build a team of great technological people that uh, shared our passion, that shared our, um, our curiosity to create UI. Uh, and uh, currently, the biggest challenge for us is the geography in a sense that we often talk to our clients and uh, just the, the time difference is quite annoying. And we tackle that by having uh, the support part of the support team work on shifts and they can support in uh, US work hours. And uh, when me and the sales team and other product managers talk to uh, potential customers or current customers, we, we stay late or talk from home. It's as simple as that. So I would like to, to talk a little about if I'm a games company or a technological company, should I use an off-the-shelf solution, a product that I have not developed myself? And this is a, uh, a thing that I ask myself all, all the time. While we create our technology, we have to decide in some moments if we are going to use something or develop it ourselves. And uh, I want to share with you how I approach that problem. Very often, I see the so-called not invented here syndrome. I'm not immune to that. Uh, we work in an industry where people are very smart. And they often believe that uh, they can create a piece of software better than uh, somebody else who has uh, created it previously. This might be the case. But always ask yourself, is this my business? I know personally that I'm in the business of creating game user interface technology. And uh, I'm not in the business of creating performance optimization tools or, or something like that. So when I optimize and measure how our software works, I just go and buy Vitune. Intel had, has developed that. It's a great product. It's theoretically possible that I can write the same tool or probably even a better, a better one if I, if I take years. But that's not my business. I'm, I'm here to do another thing. And at the same time, uh, when you're a game company and creating a game, your business is usually the game. There are some exceptions uh, when you want to create your own technology. And uh, here the biggest example, of course, is third-party game engines, which have become uh, now the norm. Almost everybody uses them. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I believe that the most important is that just the quality bar of games has gone so, so far up. You cannot get away with a mediocre game that looks ugly, or uh, the, the audio is not working fine, or, or stuff like that. You, there is a bar that you cannot go down. And then if you go a lot more up, you might be successful. 
but uh, now the technology bar is so high that you have to invest a lot of money and a lot of time to, to reach it. And if you're a company like uh, EA or Ubisoft and so on, you can do that. They have their own engines. But uh, they use middleware as well because they have usually one team that creates the engine and all other games use it. So they don't create a new engine for every game. And they, uh, this is simple economics. They can leverage the cost of creating and developing that engine across a lot of products. Uh, the other reason, obviously, is that game development is risky business. Uh, you're more, a lot more likely to lose money than to gain money while creating a game. So sharing risk is a major factor when deciding if you're going to use a technology. For instance, if you have a problem with that technology and you have developed it yourself, and you have a problem, you're on your own. You have to solve that problem in your time. If you have a partner that you believe is, uh, is uh, reliable, it's their problem. They have to fix it and help you out. Uh, beware of super large providers if you're a small company. And this is something that I have uh, learned the hard way. But if you're a smaller company and uh, you talk and, and uh, try to strike a deal with a very large company, the sheer difference in the way that the communication works might be a big risk for you. Uh, if you have a problem in Unity and uh, you're a small team and you want a bug fixed, good luck. Specialized technology obviously reduces uh, costs because somebody else is doing it and that somebody else can leverage multiple customers that allow him to R&D and to operate on that technology. Again, this is economics. 101. Of course, there are a lot of pitfalls that you should be aware of. Uh, something I hear is, my game is super unique, so I cannot use a third-party engine. That is probably true for less than 1% of games that are developed. 99% of the games that you see, and even the successful ones, are the same thing, but with a twist. And there's no problem with that. I, I have seen amazing, super innovative games that are unfortunately very boring, nobody plays. And even if you believe that uh, a piece of technology is not suitable for you, usually you can think again and try and modify it. Just, just nudge it a bit and it will, it will probably work for you. Another possible pitfall is uh, when you uh, have a provider and he's not responding. You have a problem and nobody's answering you. Uh, nobody's helping you out. So my advice is avoid one-man and unreachable developers. One-man teams are uh, great if you want to support somebody that has a good idea, but an extremely big risk um, technology-wise technology -wise and business-wise. Because if that person uh, decides to do some, get something else in their life, or has a problem, or uh, gets sick, or gets on vacation, you're on your own, probably with a piece of software that you have no idea how it works. So try to find a reliable, try to work with a company. Uh, try to talk in person to that company. Uh, Skype or phones work great, but never uh, work, especially if, if that company uh, has a piece of technology that is in, that is very important to your product, only by email. When you talk in person, you can see that there are real people there. You can see how they, uh, how they think, what uh, knowledge they have, and uh, if the language would be a barrier, because you'd be surprised how often it is. And you usually want at least some support that is better than just a forum. A lot of software, just a forum, you go there and you ask a question, it, it, it doesn't work for professional, for professional software. You want uh, email support or Skype support or something that will get you to a real person immediately. And the last problem is technology is not working as advised. You have bought a piece of software, you're two days from releasing, you have worked for an year with that technology and you find the problem. 
Well, that's the toughest one, and uh, my advice is do your evaluation very, very thoroughly. It's simple. Every piece of software has, an evalu uh, has a trial. Try your software, try that software in the way that you expect it to be stressed in the final game and avoid surprises. So where are we now as a company? Uh, we are currently around 50 people in downtown Sofia. We have two major products and a lot of different products that work around them, uh, along with them, an editor and so on. And uh, for us, what's coming next? We are currently evolving our products, of course. We have a new version, a major version of GT coming up, new versions of Hummingbird and so on. But for us and for me personally, virtual and augmented reality are the new frontier. Uh, they are the new frontier for games, the IT industry, and technology in, in a, the broadest sense of the word. And I'm a big believer of that. I know that not a lot of people are, but uh, if you don't uh, trust me, trust Facebook who have, uh, uh, some, I believe, three billion dollars they have uh, spent on Oculus, just Google who are doing their own things. So even if I'm wrong, they probably aren't. And uh, while working on our technologies, and on VR of course, we noticed that uh, a lot of the requirements of virtual reality in the web are very similar to the requirements of uh, game UI in games. You have a lot of uh, performance restrictions, memory restrictions, and so on. And the current technology that is uh, popular web uh, engines are not that good. Everybody who's using Chrome and uh, knows how much memory it, it uses. So our technology, however, is very fast. And now what we are building is uh, the first virtual reality centric web browser. You can browse the web in virtual reality. You can access uh, virtual reality experiences in a better way than uh, all other uh, web browsers. And this is a culmination of everything we've been doing so far, uh, a culmination of our technology. And uh, this will be available for free in a couple of weeks on gear. And uh, a couple of weeks more will be coming to all major virtual, virtual reality platforms. Uh, we also have something for people that want to create virtual reality experiences with the web workflow uh, will have a packager that will allow you to create virtual reality experiences and distribute them as standalone applications. So stay tuned. And uh, for us as a company, uh, the journey has just, be uh, just begun, actually. We are starting a lot of new things and I hope that uh, next year or in a couple of years, I'll be able to uh, tell you how those things have gone. So, thank you very much.